Okay, we're going to turn to some of your questions, and I'm going to say right now, we are not getting through all of them. They're great. A lot of them are really complicated. Um, we're going to have Q&A with this panel for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to go to networking. Uh, both, we'd love to hear from you as public. Um, as Kristen had our stakeholders raise their hand, there's a lot of them here. I hope you'll ask more. And if you have more questions, if you wouldn't mind writing them down and putting them on the sign-in table, we will try to address them in the future. We really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, with that, I want to, guys, you're going to have to share mics. We're just going to kind of pass these down. I'm going to try to at least hit the categories. I, like I said, you have wonderful questions, and there's a lot of them. I'm going to start with a couple of really easy ones because uh, there seem to be things that people want to know. This is, I think, the one word one. Is the meat bucket below the golf course? <laughs> Mike. The meat bucket is. And if you can grab a mic or yell. <laughs> I can just yell. Yeah, the meat bucket is on the north side of most of the golf course. It's on the north side of the west court. Uh, it is underneath the driving range. Okay, so when you're in the driving range, you're over the meat bucket. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I think this, Duke and I, we're getting the mics. I think this one's for you. Out of the 570 uh, memberships of the Yellowstone Club, how many are year-round Montana residents? <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't need to take off my shoes. There's, uh, I think we're up to five or six full-time residents up there right now. So I think our clientele is getting to the point where they're in retirement or whatever. There's a lot of people choosing to live up in the Yellowstone Club or uh, ever. Okay, great. Thank you. And just, we have 570 memberships, so we don't have 570 houses up there. So there's, there's people that own property that don't have a house on it. So I think we're up to about 380 houses, which doesn't make the ratio any better. Native born parents would be there, but uh, it's not 570 houses. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, one more on these, guys. Please try to peg them, and we'll try to get you answers, too. Um, Ron, this looks like it's for you. Is How'd you come up with the disposal values? It says, I think it was 143 million gallons. Uh, is that the water due to the grass? So they're basically asking, where's those capacity numbers for the land application coming from? Those came from our engineers when we did our plant upgrade in the 90s, 96. They did calculations based on our elevation, tobacco transpiration rates, soil conditions, number of irrigation days, and that changes depending on where you are in the big step. We're at 120, you go up to the club and you're probably dropping 20 days of irrigation. And it's also based on how much precipitation we would get over a, a year. And so the design varies depending on what kind of summer we have. So far, we, I don't think we've had uh, over a wettest year in 10 in the 20 years I've been here. But this could have the superintendent's play very well. Well, and, uh, yeah, the superintendent, and they're running it like a golf course. We want to run it like a hay field to get rid of the tree tomorrow. So there's that dynamic of our guys and their guys and trying to make it all work, and it has worked pretty well for 20 years. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to move on to some wastewater questions. I know there's more factual questions, and we'll try to get answers to them. Um, but a quick one, uh, Ron, this is probably yours, but it might be some other ones. Is the water that is withdrawn from the area serviced by the Big Sky Water and Sewer District, so remember that piece that Ron showed us, moved into a different sub-watershed when it is pumped to the Yellowstone Club Gulf Irrigation? If so, what are the effects of do moving that water around? It's uh, the same watershed. Uh, they're irrigating at a much lower rate up there. When they built their course, uh, they actually created a soil profile, so their water demands around 25 million gallons a year. All this irrigation is designed on agronomic uptake. So theoretically, you're irrigating. It's not going into the ground to replenish the aquifer. It's being used up by plant growth. 
same thing with the metaphor. But it stays in the watershed here. The, the watershed boundaries on the moonlight side, but we do not pump any water up the moonlight days. Uh, several of you have wastewater treatment plants could maybe speak to this. What's the feasibility of using biological versus mechanical systems um, in wastewater treatment in this area? Next, don't you? Well, there, there are biological processes that go on in these mechanical plants. I'm not exactly sure what's inferred by the question. Does anybody recognize that question? Maybe you could uh, help us with a follow up on that. Uh, it's the piece of. Using wetlands for treatment. Were you, were you interested? You said ponds as an example. Anybody sound like your question? Uh, move on. Move on. Okay. But there are biological systems, and hopefully the constructed wetland example would help too. Um, this is one for any of you. Uh, our septic stakeholder not, might want to answer too, but have you considered a septic maintenance program or district to keep contamination under control? Um, anybody want to comment on that one, or is that something we should be considering in the future? I can comment on uh, in our district, everybody's connected to sewer basically. We have a few properties that are not up the North Fork. But when we built our plant, we actually put in a septic receiving station that could accommodate trucks coming into our plant. But we're not going to organize a septic maintenance program outside of our district boundary. But if part of Big Sky wanted to do that and work with us to bring in trucks over time, we would certainly entertain that. Uh, the Gallatin River Task Force has developed a septic system educational brochure. Uh, just recently, uh, we plan on bringing that to homeowners associations and other educational opportunities to educate homeowners on the importance of maintaining our septic system. So I think a lot of that issue is with education. And if you can educate homeowners on what they need to do, then I think they'll want to do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Gallup River Task Force actually has several septic information pieces on their website. Yes. Um, try to combine a few. We'll see how this works. One of the questions was about future direct discharge. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what the answer was, but the past is there has been no direct discharge to the Gallatin, and that seems to be background for this question. Uh, Land application, as Ron mentioned, is how treated wastewater is disposed. So the question is, what is the net effect to our rivers and streams um, of the percolating treated water when it is used for irrigation? So are there any impacts or other effects? Yeah, I, I could answer um, part of that question. So We've done some extensive studies on the golf course looking at the impacts of irrigation, and there definitely has been impacts on the West Fork of the Gallatin. So, um, you know, like Ron was mentioning, the, the amount that you irrigate is dictated by these engineering equations that don't necessarily agree with how water moves through the system and is taken up by plants. So, Eventually, some of that water does percolate into the groundwater and get to the West Fork, and I think that is the main cause of the water quality impairment that we have on the West Fork today. And a footnote to that, the golf course was built in the 70s. It was one of the first things that went in here in Big Sky. And there's parts of that course that run through wetter areas. They put drain tile in. And we don't have maps or as-built drawings of where all those drain tiles go. So there's areas on the golf course that we irrigate. It intersects those drain tiles, which run to the middle fork. And you basically have to dig up a lot of dirt to even find where those things are. So that's part of what I think we have going on. Okay, great. And kind of this is a question that sort of coming full circle discussing wastewater and moving back to the ecological health. Uh, are there ideas about how to use wastewater to improve ecological conditions, uh, like wetland creation, um, or ways to turn a problem 
into a resource. If you guys want to discuss this, this is something the group's going to be looking at quite a bit in the next several months. But do any one of you want to address kind of ideas or approaches for turning, taking some of that wastewater to improve ecological conditions? Any of you? Well, I can. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Bob's going to start, and then we'll get to Kevin. Yeah, I, I think what. I think one of the, the main things that's going to come out of this forum is that there's no one single item that's going to work. So we're going to need to take a look at a variety of ways to dispose of water and treat water. And the other piece of this is if, if you're looking at augmenting ecological health, it varies from year to year. So one thing that will work this year may not work in a wet year or a dry year. So we're going to need a, a wide palette of options to work from. And as we set aside a policy is when do we utilize those tools the best for the maximum efficiency. So I think that's one of the main things that we want to look at is how do we get a broad spectrum of options to work from. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make a general statement first. Eh? The more water we can get back to the stream, the better the ecological health will be. And so when you look at you know, long-term climate change impacts and a change in the hydrograph, as, as Bob showed us, what it's, you're, we're gonna have an earlier spring runoff, and one of the elegant things about making snow with that flowing is it's a much denser snowpack, and so you actually prolong that hydrograph. So if we could do some things that, that would get the water back to the stream, and, and I'm making a major assumption that this is clean, clean water, that we could have some, some positives, some net positives to our watershed. And I'll just add from the water rights perspective, um, consumption is the key word. And when you are 100% consuming your wastewater, which is what land application does, that means when your water rights use that consumption, consumptive use is, is very high. But if you can return some of that, that's a, a, a way to look at potentially maximizing water supply. Because then if you return some to the system, you don't have to mitigate for that. You have to mitigate for what you consume from the system and new uses, but not what you return. That's considered still in the system. So that's that's another tool for the water supply in the future too. Uh, one thing to note is uh, it's not any of these solutions aren't fraught with with issues. Um, someone had a slide up there of a tribe that was bummed out about doing the right thing. Or this community was trying to do the right thing and another group was upset. Uh, we we did a pilot study of Snowmaking at the Yellowstone Club with treated water uh, about five years ago in a district. And Yellowstone Club partnered up with some other members of the community. We blew a million gallons of snow, tested it, tested the soil profiles, all that stuff. And what it resulted in is the exact same discharge permit that you need anywhere. So what happens with snowmaking is the problem is that it's great because it stores water in the watershed, and as Kevin mentioned, it, it slowly releases into the waterways, but you don't have plants uptaking the nutrients in that. So in spring runoff conditions, you don't have uh, the cleansing nature of the plants yet because they haven't come in, and it just all ends up in your creek as well. So we worked with the DEQ on that. The DEQ was hand in hand with us doing a snowmaking pilot study, but at the end of the day, they wrote us a big long letter saying you need a discharge from the out. So it's kind of one and the same thing at, at the one point in time now, it, it, the stores benefit is good, but then you have this big marketing piece to get over as well, like you your kids playing in the snow and what people think about that. So that's one issue. And then if you go to the purple pipe on the irrigation side, you know, what issues are with that? And there are big costly infrastructure issues and it's very expensive to reroute pipes through all the streets and everything again. Um, and you can go on and on. Each one of these has its own nuance to it. So. Anybody else on this one? Uh, I'd like to change a little more directly to the health of the ecosystems. Uh, would you say that the health of the ecosystem is declining, stable, or improving based on biodiversity and other ecosystem functions? It's a very broad question. Um, any of you like to discuss from the big sky area kind of what you're seeing? You got this yeah. <laughs> so, again, 
Um, there are impairments out there. We have a lot of room to improve on certain aspects of things. And at the same time, we're seeing uh, opportunities to uh, benefit from the improvements. Um, Gallup River Task Force has put together the TMDL, and we're seeing water quality improvements. Is it fast? Probably not as fast as we'd like, but there are improvements occurring, and that's because we're doing a community-based management. We're looking at what the values of the community are, focusing on the areas that are important to us. And so as we look forward to what this forum generates, I think it, the, the last thing we want to do is preclude those benefits. How do we choose what's the ideal thing to do with water and what those benefits can be and where we're going to see the maximum improvements. So to that end, there are improvements and there's a lot of room for improvements. And the other piece of that is we understand where some of the deficiencies are and we can focus on those moving forward. Uh, yeah, so uh, it is our goal to understand streams and stream health at the DEQ. That is our 305B, 303D, there's some jargon for you. But the reality, just the plain language there, um, the majority of the streams, if we go by stream miles on those maps, um, are in good condition. Um, the minority of them do have some concerns. Um, those mostly be in nutrients and or sediment. Um, the TMDL is just a plan, it's a restoration plan that looks at who owns those sources. Um, and that's out there. It's been embraced in the local community. Um, and it is something to recognize as or if build out occurs. Who is the existing source of the pollutants and what is their future going forward? Septic is a big issue. Um, just because it doesn't have a surface water discharge permit doesn't mean it ultimately has the same fate. So um, it's all inter interplay, but right now we're dealing in a very proactive scenario. Um, small minority streams are reactive right now. Great. Anyone else on that one? Uh, I'd like to move then, uh, time for a couple more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, if the stakeholders in this group could briefly raise their hands, um, I want you guys to kind of see them. Everybody who's actually a member of this stakeholder has been working on this. Remember, after we finish this formal question period, uh, we're hoping you'll stay, network, talk, share your ideas and perspectives and questions. And also, if you have any more ideas or questions, put them on the back. But we have time for two or three more questions before doing that. Uh, there's a bit a bunch of questions about development, which makes sense, ranging from factual to um, proposing various ideas. And we really appreciate that. Uh, and I, I want to say that I can't capture the full richness of it. But uh, this question seems to address quite a few of them. Um, says there are potential opportunities to implement best practices from a developer standpoint, uh, working with natural systems, building placements, implementing um, innovative water conservation, kind of a list of ideas. What kind of incentives would be needed um, in order to implement EMPs that watershed, that prioritize watershed health and protection? Um, and in the end, who should be held responsible for improved practices? Come on, it's got to be taken, guys. <laughs> you can start from your perspective. <laughs> uh, I can start from my perspective real quick. I mean, um, we are the regulatory agency, and one of the things we face as challenge is to push uh, Water quality standards that are nearly impossible to meet in regulation. Um, it's something we at Montana have done um, with the idea of if no one does it, the engineering won't come. So the technology won't be out there. Um, so we do have some water quality standards that are very stringent, very difficult to meet with the idea of pushing technology. The incentives are a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're in the business of creating places for people to enjoy themselves in what we love Montana and the reason why we love Montana. 
having standards, as we have spoken to before, of the bare minimum to get by with isn't how we operate. And I, neither, neither of these developers that are sitting out here today, besides myself, operate that way. It's not really about what we do, and it's not, it's not our goal. Our goal is to go above and beyond the standards and use it from a business standpoint to market the project, but also from a holistic standpoint to to be better with the environment. So we have a culture at Yellowstone Club, and, and I know there's probably a lot of misconception. And it wasn't, I will we'll say this, it wasn't our culture back in 2000, 2002, and 2003, but our new leadership group, our new ownership group, we have a culture, and we, we hit these topics daily on, on how we're gonna do that. And we, we have environmental managers, and we have stewardship people on staff full time that pay attention to this stuff. So it's meaningful to us. Yeah, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, Big Sky Water and Sewer District manages all of our properties. But as I said earlier, we have to work as a team very closely. And we, we're committed to the pristine nature of Big Sky. It's what sells. And we are very serious about it as we work as a team with everyone at the table. Um, you, the incentive is great, but you have to just have it in your culture. And it's day-to-day it's -day and in the relationships. So. All right, um, and this is more or less a follow-up question, though. These are written by different people. Uh, there's, what are the different sets of values between those who are making money off of development and those who make money off the land? Uh, beyond this meeting, how will those values be brought together, sort of the different users of the water and uh, how they value it? After this meeting, what happens next and reconciling various uses and users? In our shop, we don't particularly get too concerned about who's using what. We just try to stay one step ahead of that use, which has been a bit tricky. Um, staying ahead of the demand for capacity, both in wastewater and drinking water. We heard Terry talk about drinking water is getting tougher to get water rights for that. So as we go forward, we're trying to figure out how we're going to just expand our facilities to stay a little bit ahead of all the uses going on. We don't shape how things are used when people come in and pull permits from us. We don't get involved with zoning issues. We don't get involved with homeowner associations. And I don't think that's something you should be getting involved with. But, you know, from the development side of it, you guys can come on. We share. Yeah. We we do and we our water operators run and they, they meter read every uh, bottle of water consumption every month and we have our top ten list. So every month we have our top ten users of uh, uh, Yellowstone Flood water supply and we send those people letters. We play the shame game and this you should look at this and it's not because we don't have enough water or we're running out of water. It's because it's the, the right thing to do. We have a tiered rate. If, if users use too much water, they get penalized for it. Um, all those conservation mechanisms are in place. And Ron does the same thing. Ron has a tier rate structure as well, and if the heavy users get hit, the biggest penalties are the biggest charges for water. So, yeah, it, it's always interesting every month when an operator comes in with a list and who's the top 10 guys, and you would be surprised that, that those people do care, and they care about how they're managing their properties and how their property managers are handling it, and the reaction is, I rarely have a person hit the top 10 list more than once. Unlike Ron, we do manage associations, though, and uh, we have teams that go out there and maintain these properties in a way that it's as efficient as possible. Ron's crew will call us and say, hey, you know, you got a, you got a hot tub that's going through the roof right now and get this stuff taken care of. It takes us a while sometimes, but we do pursue it. I think all these different users and values are represented, uh, are represented as part of the water forum, and so they will be brought to the table when we're analyzing options for the future. Kevin, did you have some 
keep seeing Kevin down there. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I'm at the end. You can leave the microphone down there. Uh, I'll tie this a little bit back to the next question, but the, what I heard at the end of that is what happens next. And what you guys saw here today, where we spent the last few months, is just getting a common understanding of the issues that we face, both on the ecological health, the water availability, as well as the wastewater. And really the next step is to drill into some of the stuff that Troy presented, which what are the best practices? So I'll tie this back to the last question on, on the best practices. And I really do feel there's not a silver bullet. It, it's, it's a shotgun approach. It's gonna be a myriad of solutions that we need to, to implement. I wanna stress that what Mike and Brian were saying, you know, on the development front, we're not just doing a 10 unit project and moving on. We're here for the next 20 or 30 years. And so it's imperative upon us to make sure that we really protect this place. And we want to be here at the table with the community figuring out these best practices. There's some regulatory hurdles we need to work for or work through. And that's why I'm so glad to see the DEQ and the DNRC as part of this. You know, and an example is rainwater harvesting. It would be great to take the water off the rooftops of some of these homes and use it to irrigate their landscaping. There's a gray area in water law in Montana, whether or not that's that's it, that's even legal. So there's some different things that I'm just real excited about the next six months working with these groups that explore because it's got the right minds and details working on it. Okay, thank you. This is the last question in this forum, but I encourage you to keep talking. Uh, to one another, ask more questions, and we won't lose these. We'll try to get these addressed on the website. Some of them are going to take quite a while, and we really appreciate your ideas. Some of them really are going to require analysis. Uh, but this is the last question, is how would you briefly summarize the water story of the Big Sky area, which includes the mountain, the meadow, and the canyon?